Well, good morning to Margate Baptist Church. It's our morning service, the end of the Matthew 25 series. I invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew 25. We've looked at the parable of the ten bridesmaids, the parable of the three servants, and today we're looking at the teaching of Jesus of the partitioning of people into two groups. When I was a young man, uh, up to the age of about 16, I attended something called the Boys Brigade at Bulaway Baptist Church. I don't know if you've ever heard of Boys Brigade. We used to call it BB. It was begun in 1883 by a gentleman in Scotland and with the following objective. To develop Christian manliness using semi-military discipline, gym, camps, religious services, etc. Well, I used to love going to Boys Brigade. I used to love especially the, the drill uh, we used to dress in the in the BB uniform and march around the hall, left, right, left, right in our squad. It was such fun. Of course, the rookie mistake was to turn left when everybody else turned right. There was nowhere to hide uh, when you did that. I used to love my drill. We're learning in this series in Matthew 25 that one day soon, perhaps, there'll be nowhere for us to hide. God bless you as we turn to Matthew 25 and read from verses 31 to 46 right now. Matthew chapter 25, reading from verse 31. The sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not for the least of these, you did not do for me. But they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. I want to follow a very simple outline today in this conclusion to Jesus' teaching in Matthew 25, and it, for it to have the sudden and dramatic impact that Jesus intended. Just three areas we're going to consider today, not if, but when, verses 31 to 33. Not some prophetic carpenter, but a powerful king this time, verses 34 to 45. And then not some temporary parole, but eternal punishment, verse 46. Jesus said this, when the Son of Man returns. He said when, not if. These days are pointing towards this conclusion, folks. Jesus may be getting ready for the marriage feast of the groom and the bride. The master may have booked his return ticket to planet Earth. How will he find you and I? Second, he's coming in a vastly different role and by way of appearance. He left as the Son of Man, the Savior of the world. He's returning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
We got to know him as saviour and friend. We'll get to experience him next time as judge and jury. So this next phase of existence that we're about to enter into, perhaps, is not some temporary intermission between main events. We can't ask for a postponement or a retry. There will be no leniency, no parole, no community service, no early release on good behavior. The option for mankind is binary. It's one or the other, but eternal in both cases. So throughout the series, I've looked at what John Calvin, the reformer, has said about this passage of scripture. And he writes, what he formerly described under parables, that is Jesus, now he explains clearly and without figures. So then Christ now sits on his heavenly throne, as far as it is necessary that he shall reign for restraining his enemies and protecting his church. But then he will appear openly to establish order in heaven and earth, to crush his enemies under his feet, to assemble his believing people, to partake of an everlasting and blessed life to ascend his judgment seat, and in a word, there to make visible the manifestation of his kingdom in his glory. Because while he dwelt in this world as a mortal man, he appeared in the despised form of a servant. So let's take a look at the two groups that uh, Jesus outlines in this teaching. There is going to be a partitioning of mankind into one of two groups. The first is the group of the sheep. On the right hand side, Jesus says in verse 43 to them, come. And he says of us, we are blessed. He gives to us and promises eternal life. And he says these words, what you did for them, you did for me. By way of contrast, though, there is another group. It's the group of the goats. They are, are on the left hand side. Now, this has nothing to do with political persuasion. I can set your minds at rest. But he says of that group, depart. He says of them in verse 41 that they are cursed. And he prescribes to them eternal punishment. And he says, what you didn't do for them, you didn't do for me. You know, in many ways, uh, what Calvin had to address uh, still applies today. Addressing this passage of scripture in 1550, Calvin had to battle with the, the Catholic assertion that heaven was attained through faith in Christ and through faithful adherence to church dogma, practice, and good works especially. As I talk with folks today and ask the question, what would you say to God if he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? Do you know that they often respond, with, I did this and I did that. I tried hard. I failed here a little bit, I know, but I, I could have gone to church more perhaps and given more money. But then I tried. I tried to be good and kind, etc., etc. Let me emphasize today Jesus' teachings. Good works is the evidence of grace, not the pathway to salvation. You see, the righteous diminish and they discredit their own good deeds. The righteous folk say, when did we do that, Lord? We don't remember. That wasn't important. That's not why we did that. But religious folks embellish and recount their good deeds and their good works. Oh, but I gave, I helped, I was a member of, and so on. I'd like to close this whole series by looking very closely at verse 46. You see, Jesus uses a word here that literally means to come and to go. To come from one place and go to another. And notice what follows right on the heels of the last verse of chapter 25. Now I know some of the young people are saying, well, the first verses of chapter 26, and, and you'd be right. But listen, Jesus says this at the beginning of chapter 26. Matthew does. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away. The Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. You see, Jesus was teaching the inescapable process that we all must face and respond to. And I'd like you to look at the diagram that goes up on the screen right now. So to summarize, 
we've looked at the parable of the ten, we've looked at the parable of the three, and now today we are looking at the partitioning into two, into two groups. Jesus came first as the suffering servant, and he alludes to that in chapter 26. He points to the cross and the, the fact that the Passover sacrifice was just coming. Jesus knew that he himself would be the Lamb of God. And we come to God through repentance, repentance from our sins, and, and we ask and for and receive forgiveness. The choice is ours. We have to make that choice. That's what Jesus did yesterday on the cross, and that's what we do today by receiving forgiveness and salvation. But oh, tomorrow, folks, it may be soon. Jesus is going to say, come. He's going to gather from all the nations of the world, everybody that is alive at the time. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 32. He's going to say, come. And our sovereign king is going to sit on the throne in his glory. And there will be separation, folks. This might happen tomorrow. It may happen the day after. It may happen several years from now or hundreds of years from now. But the times that we are in points us to this conclusion. That one day Jesus the King will separate into left and right the sheep and the lambs. And he will say you have come from every corner of the world. Now go. Go to your eternal forever state. And some of us will go to eternal life because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Not because of our good works, but because of what Jesus did. And some will go to eternal punishment and separation from God forever and forever. As I come to the so what today, I always end with the application for us. And we need to return to basics today. I want to say that until Jesus comes, until that final trumpet call, we need to preach the gospel with accelerated urgency. We really do. We need to serve the Lord with renewed faithfulness as his servants. We need to look to the skies with an excited readiness for his return. And we must sacrifice ourselves for the poor and the needy with increased compassion. Let me pray for us as I close today. Oh, Lord Jesus, we have looked at the series in Matthew and we know, Lord, now from what you've taught us and what you've told us that you're coming soon. Lord, may we be ready, may we be excited and may we know in our hearts that you come as our saviour. You come as judge, Lord, but you're coming to assign us to a home in heaven and to eternity. Lord, may we be found as good and faithful servants. May, may we serve those who need a glass of water. May we give to the needy. We, may we help the poor and the downtrodden. Lord, thank you that you are encouraging us in these days, that when we do this for the least of them, we do it for you. So, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you. And amen.